Okay, uh, we were saying the last time that John Wesley underscored the importance of holiness. And I mentioned a treatise to you, uh, that pungent treatise, um, A Blow at the Root or Christ Stabbed in the House of His Friends. Now, I actually want to read to you the four maxims, the four basic teachings of this little treatise, and you can see how pungent they are and uh, almost like a splash of cold water in the face, you know, shaking you up, uh, what Wesley has to write here. Listen to the first maxim. No, it cannot be. None shall live with God, but he that now lives to God. And so what's Wesley doing there? He's drawing a connection between present life and glory. Uh, he's drawing a, a relation between them. Listen to the second maxim. None shall enjoy the glory of God in heaven, but he that bears the image of God on earth. Once again, Wesley's drawing a relation between present reality, you know, are we in the image of God uh, in, in, in holiness, and then the future reality of being with God in heaven. Listen to the third maxim. None that is not saved from sin here can be saved from hell hereafter. That's very pungent. That's very focused. Saying, okay, we need to be saved from sin here in this life if we expect to be saved from hell hereafter. And then the last uh, uh, maxim is none shall see the kingdom of God above unless the kingdom of God be in him below. Okay, once again, Wesley drawing a relation between present realities and future hopes. Present realities uh, and future hopes. Okay, now we were talking yesterday about the end or goal of religion, which is holy love. Uh, and Wesley actually uh, has a powerful image that I want to share with you along these lines. Um, uh, that uh, he has a sermon entitled On Zeal. That's the name of the sermon. And Wesley has a basic image there where everything ha finds its place. So it's a good sermon to take a look at to get an understanding of Wesley's theology. What's the image? Well, <laughs> it's a throne room. It's a throne room. Think of a throne room with a king or queen sitting on a throne, okay? You've got a literal chair. You've got a throne there. That's the image he's working with, okay? Now, listen to what Wesley writes. In a Christian believer, love, we could say holy love and be accurate, love sits on the throne, where it is erected in the inmost soul, namely the love of God and man, Wesley writes, which fills the whole heart and reigns without a rival. Okay, now we're rippling out. We're rippling out from that center, that center of holy love. What's the next thing? In a circle near the throne are all the holy tempers, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, fidelity, temperance, and if any other were comprised in the mind which was in Christ Jesus. Okay, so you have holy love on the throne, then all the holy tempers and affections at the next ring, the next circle, if you will. Okay, and then going out further, what do we find? This, this many have made commentary on this. They, uh, Wesley then writes, Next are the works of mercy, the works of mercy, whether to the souls or the bodies of men. See, that, that's actually important. I need to make a little commentary on that. Uh, Wesley is placing works of mercy in a very important rung, so to speak. Notice that works of mercy are not simply to the bodies of people. Because Wesley is talking about what else? 
What other kinds of works of mercies? To their souls, to their souls. In our age, we often forget that. We often forget that, okay? Um, and he's saying, you know, by exercising works of mercy, we exercise holy tempers. By these, we continually approve them such that they are a real means of grace, a real means of grace. Next to the works of mercy, we're going out further. What is there? There are works of piety, works of piety, uh, reading and hearing the word of God, public, family, private prayer, receiving the Lord's Supper, fasting, abstinence, okay? Uh, so those are the things here. Now, some people have said, I'll make a little commentary on this, some people have said, well, look, the works of mercy are ahead of the works of piety. Well, yes, that, that's, that's right. I mean, if you meet your hungry neighbor, uh, you first feed your hungry neighbor before you talk to them about Jesus uh, would be a way to do it. Uh, and I've talked about this in terms of, I actually have written a whole article, published an article on this issue. What we see in Wesley's writings is there's chronological priority. In other words, what are the first things we do when we're among the poor? We ask them, do you have sufficient food? Or do you have a place to stay tonight? Do you have sufficient clothing, etc., etc.? But then Wesley uses language, and this is Wesley's language. He's making a value judgment. Friend, come up higher. Having ministered to their bodies, now minister to their souls. Okay? Uh, ministers of the gospel, preachers, are not simply glorified social workers. They're not. They can minister to the bodies of people, but they can bring a ministry and a grace that no social worker could ever bring because we can bring the glad tidings of salvation uh, and minister to their souls uh, and, and further this image of God in which they have been created. I one time gave a lecture on Wesley and this person came up to me afterwards and you know, he wanted to pick a fight with me. You know, there are such people. Uh, and he said, well, look, look, you know, works of mercy are ahead of works of piety. You know, everything is external. Everything is, you know, do these external works. But I, you know, should have reminded him uh, before the works of mercy are what? All the holy tempers. That's inward religion. All the holy tempers of long suffering and gentleness and meekness and fidelity and temperance. Those tempers and dispositions of the heart. Okay. Uh, yeah, he wouldn't like that uh, because that's emphasizing inward religion that we must be transformed within. It's not simply external action or works. We must be transformed within and we must invite those uh, among whom we work to enter in. Then this must come as a surprise to you, and some people don't like this either, rippling out at the next level is the church. The church, we don't get to the church until we're at this further ring um, because what Wesley is putting at the center, if you've noticed it, uh, is the human heart because love sits on the throne, holy love sits on the throne. Where does holy love sit on the throne? It sits on the throne in your heart, in your inward being, okay? And then rippling out from that are all the holy tempers and affections. And then there are the works of mercy. Yes, we're interested in works of mercy, serving the poor, feeding the poor, doing the, all of these things. Yes, but everything in its proper place. But notice their source. They come out of this transformed life, this transformed heart in which holy love is on the throne at the innermost, deepest recesses of our being. So this is a powerful sermon. There's an important image here um, uh, in terms of love. So love is the goal. Holy love is the goal. It's the telos. It's what we should be in and aiming at in all that we do. Wesley writes, faith reestablishes the law of love. Faith is the handmaiden of love, Wesley writes. Faith works by love. Faith active in love. And faith must be manifested in all manner, in all manner of good works. Okay? In all manner of good works. 
Okay, now what I'm going to do for the sake of time, for the sake of time, uh, I am going to um, summarize and give you a snapshot uh, on the sort of second half of Wesley's theology. And I've written some things up on the board which should help us to do that. And, and here's what I want to suggest. We have gone through this left-hand column very carefully. We've gone through it very carefully and great detail. We talked about the role of the moral law. <laughs> we talked about the issue of repentance. And by the way, FMFR means fruits meet for repentance. Remember we talked about that, fruits meet for repentance or fruits suitable for repentance. That's what that means here. So repentance and fruits meet for repentance. We talked about faith, justifying faith. And then we talked about assurance. We talked about assurance. Now, what I want you to see that in Wesley's practical theology, Wesley's practical theology has two foci, two foci, not one, but two. So what are the, the foci? What's the first focus of Wesley's theology? Well, it's justification. And, you know, we could write here, of course, and regeneration. Because with justification, regeneration will always be in place. That's the first focus of Wesley's order of salvation. Okay? What's the second focus of Wesley's order of salvation? Well, it's entire sanctification. It's entire sanctification. Uh, this focus deals with, and I hope you remember the very first things I said in the course, this first focus deals with the issue of actual sins, plural. The sins we commit, right? The forgiveness of sins, whether we commit them inwardly, outwardly, sins in thought, word, and deed, sins of omission, commission. This, on the other hand, entire sanctification will be dealing with sin singular, inbred sin, the carnal nature, original sin, okay? And then the cleansing of that, the cleansing of that. Now, what I want you to see uh, you know, there will be a second work of grace. And Wesley uses that language, second work of grace. I, I note that uh, in, in my book. Uh, he uses the second work of grace. And why must there be a second work of grace? Because the problem of sin is twofold. It, there are actual sins that we commit, okay? Uh, but then there is the corruption of the carnal nature that remains even in a child of God. Do you know how many Christian traditions are not attentive to that? It's almost like spiritual quackery. Uh, it's almost like a doctor who doesn't understand disease. Because part of the challenge of serious Christian discipleship is that you must live and walk in faith having a corrupted nature. A corrupted nature that still remains. The carnal nature still remains. Uh, do we talk about this in the church? Do we direct people? Do we lead people to the deeper graces uh, whereby they may walk in faithfulness? Okay? This is, you know, so many, and evangelicals are, are sometimes the greatest offenders. We're great at bringing people into the church. You know, come to Christ, be redeemed. We don't know what to do with them once they come. Amen. We don't. We don't realize that there is a life to be lived. And, and the world, the flesh, and the devil are not asleep. Okay? And, and the carnal nature remains even in a child of God. Our own nature, our own corrupted nature can be the occasion of temptation. Sin remains, but it does not reign. Sin remains, but it does not reign. There's the ongoingness. There's the ongoingness of the carnal nature. Sin remains, but it does not reign. There's the freedom of the new birth. Okay? Now, I've said all that to say something else. <laughs> uh, that I want you to recognize that in the larger structure of John Wesley's theology, and here you know, here's the two foci. Here are the two foci. There is parallelism. Parallelism. And that's why now if you've understood 
this. If you've understood this left side, you will more easily understand this now. Why? Because they are parallel treatments. They're parallel treatments. Listen, I'll talk to you in terms of, of this. Listen to what, well, I'll talk to you in terms of this issue of faith. Faith over here, faith over here, okay? Wesley talks about faith in terms of justification, talks about faith in terms of sanctification. His language is parallel. Listen to the language. Exactly as we are justified by faith, so are we sanctified by faith. Faith is the condition and the only condition of sanctification exactly as it is of justification. That's an exact quote from John Wesley. Do you see? Do you see the parallel? So, so now I ask you a question to see if you understand. If we are justified by grace through faith alone, okay, yeah, and you all understand that by this point, right? We are justified by grace through faith alone. How are we entirely sanctified? By faith through, yeah, by grace through faith alone. That's right, because it's parallel. So what Wesley is saying here in terms of this issue of faith, and here we're talking about free grace. We're talking about free grace. We're talking about... Um, grace as a sheer or utter gift. We're talking about grace as a sheer or utter gift. Uh, exactly as we're justified by faith, so are we sanctified by faith. Entire sanctification is a gift. We don't have to be or do something else first. I told you yesterday, if you look at the last part of Wesley's sermon... Uh, the scripture way of salvation, he says, and he's thinking about a person on the way to entire sanctification, so they're already a child of God, uh, and he's saying to them, if you think you must be or do something else first, then you are expecting it by works even unto this day. But if it is by the grace of God, and we know it's the free grace of God, expect it as you are and expect it now. Expect it now, okay? Wow. <laughs> you know, so, so he's saying that this great gift of entire sanctification is received by grace through faith alone, just like justification. So what's Wesley doing? He's continuing the Reformation, in other words, Luther applied this to the forensic theme of justification. Wesley is taking that and is applying it to entire sanctification. Okay? Now watch this. And this is where lots of people, they, you know, it's like driving down the road and you're supposed to get off the exit over here and you didn't. Uh, and that's what happens. Uh, they, they're going the wrong direction. They, they don't understand what's happening. Here's why. In that quote I just gave you, I used the word... Now. Use the word now. Uh, you know, I said, if you, think, if you think you must be or do something else first, then you are expecting it by works even unto this day. But if it is by the grace of God, meaning it's a gift, if it is by the grace of God, expect it as you are and expect it now. I want to look at that nowness. Lots of people misunderstand it because they're thinking of chronology. They're thinking of, oh, instantaneous, right now. And, and that's a part of it, but that's not the biggest piece here. The biggest piece here, that language of instantaneous, of now, is a window on who is the principal actor here. The principal actor here is God, a sovereign God who is giving a gift a gift uh, that can be received now. Why can it be received now? Precisely because it is a gift. We don't have to be or do something else first. It's by grace through faith. We can receive this gift now because God sovereignly gives free grace. Okay? So it's a window. I like to say the technical theological language. Uh, it's indicative of soteriological roles. And God, not us, not we, is the principal actor here. 
Okay, so with that summary in place, and see you've learned so much now by, you can draw the associations from the one to the other, uh, we're going to talk about entire sanctification uh, in great detail. And whenever Wesley uh, wanted to explore something in detail, he always started out with a kind of via negativa. In other words, what it is not. <laughs> what it is not. And he goes through a number of things saying entire sanctification is not this, it's not that. And so uh, he starts out, in what sense Christians are not perfect. So we use these terms, entire sanctification, Christian perfection, we use them synonymously, interchangeably. Wesley says that Christians are not perfect in knowledge. Not perfect in knowledge. Everyone, even if they have a pure heart, we have need to grow in knowledge. We will be growing in the knowledge and love of God throughout eternity. We will. Amen. Yes, we will be growing in the knowledge and love of God throughout eternity. Uh, to Christian perfection is not freedom from ignorance. We may be ignorant of, of many things. We may make mistakes in judgment. We may judge some people to be better or worse than they really are. We make these false judgments, okay? We cannot be free of that. We cannot be free of that kind of ignorance, that kind of mistake, okay? Uh, and then uh, Wesley says, thirdly, we cannot be free from infirmities. Infirmities. What's, what's an infirmity? Well, uh, uh, it is slowness of, uh, of understanding. Slowness of understanding. Have you ever had a problem with that? Uh, <laughs> I remember one time that this, I can illustrate this very easily. I remember one time I was lecturing on Wesley in South Korea. And I had flown, I was flying to South Korea and it was like an 11 hour flight. And I got off the flight and they took me from that 11 hour flight straight to the classroom. And I was to lecture for like an hour and a half. And I was so tired, I was so slow of understanding that when people asked me questions, I had to write down what they were asking me because I couldn't remember. <laughs> so I had to look at my note. Okay, <laughs> that's how tired I was. Uh, that certainly uh, was slowness of understanding, dullness or confusedness of apprehension. Uh, you know, we are embodied souls. The body, the body can drag down the soul. We can be dog tired, not thinking very clearly. I've been there. I've been there. I've done that uh, for sure. Um, and so Wesley talks also under this head about infirmity, uh, incoherency of thought, heaviness of imagination. I think in our context today, we could talk about a number of you know, body, soul, brain, soul interfaces where uh, we're not going to be free of that. We're not going to be free of that. Then fourthly, uh, those who are pure in heart are not free from temptation. Now, occasionally, I have a student ask the question, well, you know, if their heart is pure, if they have no carnal nature, how can they be tempted? And then I say to them, um, was Jesus Christ ever tempted? Uh, was Jesus Christ pure in heart? Uh, the pure in heart can be tempted. Uh, because all you need for temptation is a person a person with freedom, that is the freedom to do otherwise, uh, knowledge of the will of God, okay, knowledge of the will of God, uh, so you need a person, a moral agent, a context of freedom, and the known will of God. You have all the ingredients for temptation. You have all the ingredients of temptation, okay? And, and I'll say in terms of Jesus, we need to take that issue very carefully because Jesus Christ was a true human being a true human being. Sometimes, you know, we don't get that quite right. You know, we just think somehow or other that divinity just, you know, washes out this whole, he was really tempted as a true human being. Think that through, what that entails, okay? Uh, yes, the pure in heart can be tempted because Jesus Christ uh, was tempted and he was without sin. 
Uh, then the fifth thing Wesley says here, in what sense Christians are not perfect, uh, there is no absolute perfection on earth. There is no perfection of degrees, none which does not admit of a continual increase. And so what Wesley is saying here is that those who are pure in heart will continually grow. They will continually grow and they will continually increase. That's not a contradiction because it is a pure heart that will continually grow. Uh, when I was back in grammar school, the nuns used to ex explain a similar sort of issue this way in terms of beakers. Okay, you have three large vats or beakers, okay, and they're all filled up with water, okay. Uh, my question to you is any one of these beakers, which are all filled to the top, is any one, is any one of these beakers more full than the other? No, that's right. No, because they are full. They are all full. And so it is like this. The person is full. They're entirely sanctified. But they're becoming more of a person because they're growing. They're becoming more mature. They have more experience. And all of that is dedicated to conse and consecrated to God. So there is growth here. There is growth. But it's a pure heart that is growing, that is becoming more. Because we're always growing in the knowledge and love of God in terms of, uh, you know, as I said earlier, okay. Now, we have to raise the question, positively speaking, in what sense Christians are perfect? So we talked about the via negativa, in what sense Christians are not perfect. Now we need to talk about uh, in what sense they are. And here, uh, John Wesley, uh, he is especially informed by the first letter of John. So he reads the first letter of John, uh, and he's drawing a lot of material when he's thinking about Christian perfection. Uh, he's, re he's drawing that material from the first letter of John. So if you're interested in this area, that would be a good place to look, uh, the first letter of John. And so he talks about first John's several stages. Remember those stages? Little children, young men, fathers, okay? Uh, and here, Wesley says, he's only speaking about the last group. In other words, he's speaking about uh, fathers. And how may we describe them? They are free from evil tempers, meaning that the tempers and dispositions of their heart are all rightly oriented toward God. In other words, they're aiming at God as the end, as the perfection of their being. They're aiming at God as the end and perfection of their being. Uh, so their heart is pure. Uh, they, are, they have been purified from the carnal nature, from uh, pride within, from lust within, from any other unholy desire. They have been purified from. They're free from pride and sinful anger, they are free from evil tempers. They are also free from, Wesley writes, evil thoughts. Evil thoughts uh, think, you know, that, that wills evil towards the neighbor, uh, you know, any sort of evil thought that would depart from the living God, uh, that they are free from those. They are composed, they are directed towards a God of holy love as the chief end as the goal and the completion of their being. And so on this head, in this vein, Wesley quotes 1 John, quote, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, who's the he here? As he is. Christ, that's right. As he is, so are we in this world. Wow, that's some statement. That's some statement. Um, that's scripture. That's, that's Bible. That's revelation. I'm going to repeat it again because it's drawing a relation between Christ and the pure in heart. It's drawing a relation, a comparison. Uh, 
Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Okay? And so, those who are entirely sanctified, or we might use Christian perfection, they love God with all their hearts, they love their neighbor as themselves. So here is the twofold commandment of Jesus. It is being fulfilled uh, in their lives. Another way of expressing this is to say they have the mind which was in Christ. They are all devoted in heart and life to Christ. Okay, uh, And so all inward sin is taken away. No wrong temper, none contrary to love remains in the soul. Now, we've described positively what entire sanctification is, and it's basically the love of God, the love of neighbor. That's what it is. Uh, what is the condition? What is the condition of entire sanctification? You should know this already. What's the condition? Yes, faith. Faith is the condition. Faith is the condition. And as we recited earlier, see, now you know this already. Exactly as we are justified by faith, so are we sanctified by faith. Faith is the condition and the only condition of sanctification. Okay? Uh, and so we know the condition. We know what entire sanctification is. We know what the condition is. It is by faith, by grace through faith alone. Okay? When is the time? When is the time of entire sanctification? Uh, is entire sanctification available now to the children of God, to those who are justified and born of God? The answer is yes. Uh, but there are a couple of things that we're going to have to hold together here. That's a true statement. Yes, uh, because it is a gift. It is a gift. And so entire sanctification for a child of God is available today by grace through faith alone because it is a gift. You already heard that language earlier that I quoted. You don't have to be or do something else first. You just simply have to receive. Okay? Uh, but the Methodist Conference also noted, and this is what some people following Wesley, some of the Methodists following Wesley missed. They missed this. That for most people, they will not be entirely sanctified until, until when? Just prior to death. Just prior to death. So Wesley is holding up both of those things simultaneously. So you've got to hold them both together. Yes, the grace is available today. Yes, a child of God can enter in today because it is a gift. It's a thing of free grace. But for most people, they will not enter, most Christians will not enter until just prior to death. What's the problem? I've thought about this a lot, um, actually. I've thought about this a lot. Uh, in Wesley's Scripture Way of Salvation, this is what he writes in terms of entire sanctification. You may expect it as you are, and if as you are, then expect it now. But the Methodist Conference, the first Methodist Conference, said that for most, it will not occur till near death. Okay? So, what's, what's going on here? Well, express it, express it this way. What bars the way? What is the principal impediment so often to growth spiritually? Fear. Fear bars the way. Fear bars the way. And, and it may be, and I, I, this, is, this is me now speaking, this is not Wesley, I, I'm thinking why, why is that, this reality? For most people, it's not till just prior to death. Look at what entire sanctification is. It's loving God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength. It looks like we are becoming a zero. That God is all in all. It looks like we are becoming nothing. What does that look like? The nothingness, the zero. It looks like, it looks like death. It looks like death. And I think it is this ongoing fear in some sense. Not fear of condemnation because a child of God, that's past. And Wesley was past that. And Wesley addressed this issue specifically. He says, I do not fear hell, but 
he talked about another kind of fear, the fear of annihilation. Annihilation, in other words, death and nothingness. Death and nothingness. And so I'm thinking here, and this is me now, I'm, I'm speculating, I think for many uh, that fear may bar the way in some sense and that we become more ready to receive this deepest gift of grace where God is all in all, whereby we, fill in your name, love God with all the heart, all the mind, all, all the self. Where are we left in that? It's like a, a void. It, it seems like a nothingness. Uh, so, uh, in other words, it's not because people don't understand what entire sanctification entails, that it is so delayed. It's because they do understand what's involved here that it becomes so delayed. Okay, now, some may think, some may think, well, entire sanctification, you know, that, that's just a Methodist doctrine. That's just, you know, a Wesleyan doctrine. That, that's not for the Eastern Orthodox. That's not for the Russian Orthodox. That's not for Roman Catholics. That's not for Lutherans. That's not for Presbyterians. Uh, actually, it is for everyone, and I think I can convince you of that very easily. Here's why. Because I ask you the basic question. In heaven, in heaven now, is there sin? Is there sin in heaven? No. There is no sin in heaven, because if there were sin, it wouldn't be heaven, okay? So there's no sin in heaven. So the entire church agrees. Everyone agrees. We all agree. There's no sin in heaven. Okay, so the question then becomes, when is the sin problem dealt with? Okay, now we have the differences. Now we have the differences. Uh, Roman Catholics say uh, the sin problem, the carnal nature, is dealt with after death in purgatory. In purgatory, your soul is cleansed, and then you are prepared uh, to see God face to face. Okay. Um, some Lutherans teach, some Lutherans teach that death itself, in other words, dying, death itself is the sanctifier and cleanses the carnal nature. Wesley rejected that answer because he said, how can that which is going to be judged by God, you know, sin, death, and hell, how can that which is going to be judged by God, because death will be judged by God, how can that bring about holiness? It can't. And so Wesley rejects that answer. And so, and I, I love this answer of John Wesley because why? It glorifies Jesus Christ. It says that the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is Sufficient, sufficient for all our need as sinners uh, in need of a God of holy love. First, in terms of actual sins, actual sins, the kinds we commit, in other words, the freedom from that and freedom from its guilt and its power. And then secondly, freedom from its being, freedom from its being, even the carnal nature, okay? And so entire sanctification then, Wesley is arguing, can happen in this life. Indeed, it must happen in this life in Wesley's theology uh, because the grace of Jesus Christ is sufficient. It is sufficient for the entire need of the sinner. Okay. Uh, so if you have trouble with this doctrine, remember there is no sin in heaven. We are going to be cleansed at some point in some fashion. When is that and how is that? This is not the particular doctrine of the Methodists. This is the doctrine that belongs to the universal church, a church that is ever focused on a God of holy love in which we created in that holy and precious image will be renewed and restored before we see God face to face. Okay, let's take some questions. Yes? I have a question about faith. Yes. 
it looks on the blackboard like it's the same thing under justification and entire sanctification, but uh, does Wesley agree that this uh, faith under justification is more like what he says, faith of devil. You know God is, like he trembles, we don't very often. Right. But the second faith is, different. is show me faith without deeds. This is the one that got Peter out of the boat. Yes, yes. So these, we cannot put the equation. Yeah, okay. And I'm glad you raised this issue because you remind me to fill out something else. Because I, when I put this up on the board, I talked about parallelism. I talked about sameness. What I didn't talk about, and thank you, because I should mention this, there obviously, there is some sense on one level where these are very similar, because they're parallel. But there is another level where they are different. They are different because they're different kinds of faith, because faith is being understood in this context in terms of justification and, uh, you know, and the forgiveness of the guilt of sins, whereas in this context, faith is being understood uh, in terms of entire sanctification. Let me illustrate it again from the issue of repentance. What are we repenting of here in this context? We're repenting of actual sins. In other words, the sins we commit. What are we repenting of here in this context? The carnal nature. That's exactly right. That's exactly right, the carnal nature. So there's the difference. And so it's actually the blending of sameness and difference together. We talk about the sameness in terms of parallelism. We talk about the difference in terms of the, of the change in us that is taking place through God's grace such that repentance over here it looks different than repentance over here because here we're repenting of actual sins and here we are repenting of inbred sin the carnal nature so yes I'm glad you raised that issue because it gave me opportunity and and we can do that also in terms of assurance here we are assured what we're assured that we're a child of God what are we assured of here what are we assured of here in this context we are assured that our, we are pure in heart, that, that the Holy Spirit has cleansed our heart. Um, so, though on one level the two assurances are the same, they're similar, they're parallel, but in another sense they're different because the nature of the assurance is different in each context. Okay? You got that? See, now you can think deeply about Wesley's theology. Let me make this recommendation, and I might, I think this is a good recommendation for the exam. See, now I got your attention again. Okay, uh, look at the sermon, if you're able to read it, uh, the scripture way of salvation. Because in that sermon, the scripture way of salvation, which is in John Wesley's 52 standard sermons, it should be in other versions of translation, uh, he is going to lay this out. He's going to lay out the, the parallelism. Oh, yeah, it's definitely in that book. Yeah, it's in the new book of, of uh, Estonian sermons. It's there. Read that. That is going to be very helpful because it's a summary. It's a summary of Wesley's theology. It's a summary uh, of the auto salutis. And you'll see the parallelism and you'll see the difference there. Okay, you had your hand up. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, see, I wrote, I wrote justification here, but then I wrote regeneration over here. So the new birth is here. The new birth is here. Uh, oftentimes, uh, everyone simply refers to it as justification, and by that, it's just a summary way of saying justification and the new birth. Okay? But yes, 
The new birth, the new birth is, is here. It is here. It's right here. Regeneration. That's right. So, good question. Okay, okay. освещение, возрождение. И на самом деле вопрос серьезный, да? Ну а как вот на практике работает, ну или ну, в вашем опыте, как вот работает эта теология на практике? У вас там, например, в Америке. Вот сколько людей таких, которые вот реально святые, где уже, например, вот грех вообще он ну, не проявляется. О чем вот вы свидетельствовали, например, Джона Вейси? И много таких людей вы встречали в жизни? Или вы их научили этому, скажем, вот? Ну, просто интересно. Not, not only can I say that, not only can I say that I know people who, who live a daily walk of the, the consciousness of the grace of God, and who don't break faith with God uh, during the day. I, I live in the presence of, of some people who are like that. Not all Christians, but some. I have also lived in the presence of someone who had a pure heart. Uh, I talked about Arthur Albrecht before. Uh, he was the, the man who mentored me when I was a young man of 22 years old. Uh, I believe he had a pure heart. He loved God with all his heart, all his mind, all his soul, all his strength. Um, you hear the promises. You hear the promises and of the gospel. And this is clearly in scripture. We've already talked about that in Romans 6, 8, first letter of John, elsewhere. These are precious promises. I think it would be helpful, it would be helpful to, like John Wesley, to be teachable, to be humble enough to be open Amen. to what the grace of God can do, you see? Um, because unbelief shuts it down right away. If you say God cannot do this, then God cannot do that in your life. Do you understand? Amen. Let me just say this, because this is an important issue. I'm glad you raised this issue. I got out of the business a long time ago of telling God what God can and cannot do. Do you understand? I, I don't tell God what God cannot do. I am open to what God can do. And I have been surprised by what the grace of God can do. So I'm recommending uh, perhaps looking at things different way, a new way, a new perspective. To be focused not on us. If we focus on us, oh, we'll fail. We'll fail. But this is to hear the promise. It, who made the promise? God. I promise you I will do this if you receive. Okay? Uh, unbelief says, oh, God can't do that. Well, I think that's arrogant. I do. I think that's arrogant. Telling God what God cannot do. Restricting God. Saying, well, you can do so much and that's it. You see? Um, and so, you know, maybe, maybe by means of this course, maybe by means of reading the sermons of John Wesley, you are being introduced to something new. That's good. I was. I didn't know this when I was 22 years old. I wasn't taught this. I was shaken up. I was shaken up. But, and I was condemned. I was. I read Wesley's sermons. I said, man, this condemns me. I'm a sinner. But I wasn't sad. I wasn't. I remember. I remember when I was 20. I wasn't sad because I didn't see just condemnation. I saw. I saw the promise. I saw the promise that, that Christ could deliver. And then I eventually believed and he did deliver. Okay? Now, let me tell you something else. Just one other thing before you come back at me. Uh, I know of a woman, a divinity school student, she read the same sermons I read. She experienced the condemnation I experienced when I read them. She said, I'm done. I'm done with them. 
because they condemn me. I don't want that. I put that out of my life. I'm not going to look at that. And she never looked at Wesley's sermons again. So those are two different reactions. We both read them and saw condemnation. We both knew we were condemned. One was sad and turned away. The other was happy and entered in. You see? Okay, you, you have a follow-up, I see? No, Okay. Other questions, comments? Other questions, comments? There's, there is no sanctification apart from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, makes us holy by being in us. Um, our holiness is because the Holy Spirit is in us transforming our very being. Uh, we are initially holy at the new birth. We are progressively increasing in sanctification by degree over the course of the Christian life. And then finally, uh, we are entirely sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who cleanses our heart. This is important to realize that holiness is not a human possibility. It is a divine gift. It is a thing of supernatural grace, if you will. We cannot make ourselves holy. We could try all what we do. It won't work. We can only become holy by the presence of God in our souls, in our lives, the Holy Spirit in our heart. Okay? Um, so the Holy Spirit is intimately involved with holiness. There's no holiness without the Holy Spirit. And, and that's another way of saying you cannot be a Christian without the Holy Spirit Amen. in your life. You cannot. You cannot be a Christian. In other words, Christianity is not simply correct teaching, like a philosophy. Oh, I believe these things. You know, I got the right things in terms of this. I'm believing all the correct things. No. The Christian faith is a life. It's God tabernacling in our hearts. Uh, we in the spirit, the spirit in us. It's a life, a life to be lived. It's an invitation to know God, the knowledge and love of God, and to live in a new way, to live in the presence of God. Okay, other questions? Do you have a question? Because I know I felt bad yesterday. I, I sort of left you hanging there. No, 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 don't feel sorry. I just, uh, this is just a comment maybe. Yes. Because The, the what? Um, Works before the person gets a salvation. Before they, they be, before they are justified and born of God? No, no, no. Coming back to the yesterday's topic. Because my question is from yesterday. Yes, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand you. Um, because you're using the word salvation, okay? Mm -hmm. And for me, in my mind, when I think of salvation, I'm thinking of justification and the new birth or, and, and assurance. Is that what you mean when you're talking so, about a so person coming to well, salvation? Is, is that what you mean? Maybe I mean more a conversion for Yes, yes. I mean, well, if we're talking about a person who is coming to conversion, in other words, a sinner. We're talking about a sinner. We're talking about a sinner who is guilty of conscience, who is under the power and dominion of sin, they know it. Like Wesley described in the legal state, they're under the law, okay? They, they are awakened to God. They sense the spirit of God, but they fear God. They don't love God, not the way they should. So 
Wesley, as a good pastoral counsel, would work with those sinners who desired to be redeemed. And as I said yesterday, he would direct them into all of the means of grace, all of the means of grace, um, and works of mercy, of course, and leaving off evil and doing good until they would receive the gift and what it is that to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in their hearts, transforming their being, making them holy at the new birth, and then what occurs at the same time at the new birth is justification, and so then they become converted, and so they are born of God, justified, and have a measure of assurance. So conversion happens, and there is a leading up to conversion, okay, through provenient grace, through convincing grace, as we were talking the other day, okay, and then that leads up to uh, the time of conversion. Wesley said this, watch this, this is a very pungent statement, it may relate to your issue. A person can be redeemed if he will, that makes Wesley an Arminian, a person can be redeemed if he will, but not when he will. The not when he will means we are not in control. We are not in control of such things, that God is in control, that God will give the gift of grace at, whereby we enter in by grace through faith. If we do want to be redeemed, if we knock on the door, yes, yes, the door will be opened, okay? Uh, and so a person can be redeemed if he will, that's what Wesley writes, but not when he will, meaning God is in control, not we in control. Does that help? <laughs> Mark, help me. <laughs> My question is, please, yes. you just make it clear, where is discipleship in all this process? Where is discipleship? It, it's all around you. It's all no, around you. I mean, you. in the theology and the process of conversion and everything, like so many different things, where is discipleship? Well, discipleship, and we were talking about this before, that when you have a person who is justified and born of God, when you have a person who is already converted, and, and that's when I think real serious discipleship takes place because this person is willing to follow Jesus Christ, then there is, there is the growth in grace, there is the works of mercy, the serving the poor, uh, the, the, the proclamation of the gospel, the doing for others, uh, the being in the means of grace. I mean, all we've been talking about all these things throughout the course. I mean, this is what Christian discipleship is. Works of mercy, works of piety, serving others, uh, uh, serving the church, being dedicated to the church, giving our money to the church. All of these things are a part of Christian discipleship. And we have been talking about them all throughout the course. Yes? Yes. <laughs> Other questions? Other questions? Comments? Yeah. Yep. Was Melville Horn? <laughs> yeah, Melville Horn. Yeah. Melville Horn. I may, I, it, obviously, it was a, a, a correspondent of Wesley's uh, back and forth. Uh, I will have to actually look that up, Melville Horn, particularly to fill out the bi biography. It's not, I'm running the Rolodex right now, it's not coming up with anything much. Uh, so I'm sorry. I, you know, I'd have to go look that up. Melville Horn, his detail, his biography. Yes. What do you? Yeah. 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 Yes, my wish, that's a very good question, I appreciate that. Uh, my wish for Christians, whether they be in Estonia, whether they be in Europe or Africa or Asia or North America, uh, is to get back to basics, to get back to basics. Basic 
theological terms, justification, regeneration, grace, faith, holiness. We need to be talking about this in the church. We need to be preaching this in the church, okay? Uh, and so that would be my word, my counsel to the church today to bring back our story, our greatest story that can ever be told, to bring back the narrative in all its theological power so that we can receive and respond to the grace of God and be more greatly transformed into that precious image in which we have been created. See, I, I will for all of you exactly what I will for myself. What do I will for myself? I will for myself the completion of my being in God that I might be known in God and be known by God, that my life may be an expression of God's grace. That's the highest good I can think of. And that's exactly what I will for you, because that is the highest good that I could will for you, that you would find your own lives completed and perfected uh, caught up in a telos of the knowledge and love of God. There's nothing, nothing higher than that. So, very good question. I like that question. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.